to meet somebody who uh, you follow on Twitter and whose work you respect and you read, and then uh, they are kind enough to say, hey, I'm going to be in Los Angeles, which not everybody does, and then they show up here in studio and I will stop talking about these people like the, this gentleman is not sitting in my right long-time investigative correspondent for a decade and a half for the New York Times, now uh, a senior investigative reporter for ESPN.com and ESPN the magazine, Don Van Natta. Good to see you, Don. Great to see you, Rich. Uh, I'm, Thank you. I'm, uh, how many of my colleagues at the NFL front office is seeing me sitting with you right now and saying, oh, come on. <laughs> Probably more um, than a few. You think so? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Because <laughs> you and Seth Wickersham have wrote, uh, have written a couple of uh, long-form pieces for ESPN.com uh, that uh, have really ripped the lid off on uh, a lot of the conversations that owners have been having behind the scenes on the uh, kneeling during the National Anthem front as well as the commissioner's contract. So let's start with that one, last one first. <clears throat> What what is Jerry Jones's mood right around now? Best you can tell, Don. I think he's I think he's trying to put a good face on a on a bad few weeks. Uh, Jerry Jones really um, was in a tough spot. You know, earlier this year, back in May, uh, at the owners' meeting in Chicago, Jerry Jones was one of 32 owners who voted for Roger Goodell to have his contract extended. Uh, Jerry Jones, for years, has been Roger Goodell's key cheerleader on lots of different issues. On on the deflate gate issue, Jerry Jones was out there saying Roger's doing a great job. He backed him on the Ray Rice scandal. And then suddenly the Ezekiel Elliott thing happened. And as Seth Wickersham and I reported, just a couple weeks after Jerry Jones voted uh, for Roger Goodell to have that contract extended, he had a conversation. Jerry Jones had a conversation with Goodell and came away from it believing that Goodell was going to let Ezekiel Elliott off the hook on those domestic violence allegations. Uh, Jones told everybody in Dallas that, and then in August they had a follow-up conversation in which uh, Roger Goodell said, no, I'm going to suspend Ezekiel Elliott for six games. And at that moment, Jones said to him, as Seth and I reported, I'm going to come after you with everything that I have. And he tried to this fall. It was really a war over the contract. And I think that Jones hurt himself in a way with a lot of his fellow owners because they saw it really through the prism of Jerry Jones's anger over the Ezekiel Elliott punishment and not Jerry Jones's issue with a lot of other problems that the NFL is now having with ratings, with merchandise sales going down. And so, yeah, I think Jones is putting a good face on this. Goodell got his contract extension uh, for a lot of money, and uh, and Jones is, is still trying to wave a victory flag over what was clearly a loss for him, a, re- a very rare one, I might add. Well, I mean, in, in that regard, though, um, he, he, and from what I read uh, as well, has not uh, given up the fight, or at least that's what he's giving the impression of behind the scenes. Would you say that that is accurate? I I do think that's accurate. So then what does that mean? It means that Jerry Jones is going to try to make Roger Goodell's life uh, difficult uh, in the coming years. Uh, Jerry Jones believes that uh, there's not enough transparency uh, with what the league office does. He feels like some of his fellow owners, by the way, that the league office itself is bloated uh, and has been ineffective. He's particularly angry about the... Uh, entire apparatus that's been set up to do these investigations that he feels um, distracts fans, uh, is not good for the game, certainly wasn't good for the Cowboys with what happened with Ezekiel Elliott with the six-game suspension, but he thinks there's too much emphasis on that, and he doesn't like no, he, he, he's just he's tired of the bad headlines that have occurred uh, now that this has happened. What he can do going forward is uh, continue to rally owners to the view that Roger Goodell needs to do more. He needs to do a better job. And the irony is this guy got a five year contract extension for a lot of money, but he's had a pretty rough three years since the Ray Rice scandal. Goodell. And, and, and yet, you know, the, the owners stuck with him. And Jerry Jones was really pushing on a closed door. He was one of really only five owners that felt that uh, they should look elsewhere for another commissioner. Right. Don Van Natta of ESPN.com, ESPN the magazine, the invest- senior investigative reporter here in the Honda Insider Report here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, and then, you know, uh, so basically, uh, Jerry Jones, this was all because of Ezekiel Elliott, that if Ezekiel Elliott had only gotten maybe one or two games or zero games, none of the arguments that he had posited about what 
may still be the case about the National Football League. He would not have done that. Is well, basically that's, what you're saying. That's 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 what I'm implying. Let me let me, <laughs> yes, let, let me be clear. The difference let, between implying and saying. Yeah, yeah let okay. me be clear though, Rich, because if you talk to Jerry Jones about it, he will say that that's not the only reason that he had concerns about Roger Goodell's contract. He felt that the whole process there was not enough transparency. It was led by Arthur Blank, the owner of the Falcons, the compensation committee, and Jones was a sort of unofficial member of that. Remember, he threatened to sue because he didn't like the way it was going, then he got kicked off the committee. He would tell you that he didn't like the process. He felt that the contract was really rigged, that even if metrics continued to go down for the NFL, that Roger Goodell would still get paid. That's what Jerry Jones would tell you if he were sitting here was his biggest concern. But the timing of it, as I explained, is quite coincidental that after he heard that Ezekiel Elliott was going to get that six-game suspension, when he was absolutely certain he was off the hook, then Jerry Jones was very vocal uh, about all of these problems and issues he had with the contract process and with, with Goodell's performance. So would you, would you call it ironic, then, that it's entirely possible that by a week from Sunday, the team that could prevent the Cowboys from going to the playoffs because they have a tie break against them and Port Hench, potentially a better record is Arthur Blank yes. and the Atlanta Falcons, and he was the head of the compensation committee that Jerry was trying to stop, even though when you said he voted to give the commissioner the contract, they voted to give the compensation committee Correct. full carte blanche to do what they felt it needed to do to get the commissioner They re-signed. gave the authority to the right. compensation committee. That's so right. So how are, how are, how's that relationship, best you can tell? The relationship was very strained. I mean, when, when the Falcons and the Cowboys played in Atlanta about uh, a month ago, about yeah. a month ago, you know, uh, Jones and Blank stayed on opposite sides of the field. They didn't talk to each other. You know, it's customary for owners to come and greet each other. This was a wild scene. Yeah. I mean, Normally they're all, you know, it's, it's, it is the, the, the term for it. And I learned this when I first started with the NFL, it's the membership. That's they're right. Not, they're not the ownership. They call it the membership. That's right. Because they're members at a very exclusive club. It's, it is maybe the most exclusive club in America. Uh, and uh, that's right. And they, and they, they share everything. They share profits. They're all on the same side most of the time. But this was, this was a, a moment that's rare where, Jerry Jones's anger at blank, you could see it. It was, it was obvious. Uh, they saw each other at the meetings uh, just a couple of weeks ago right. in Irving, or last week in Irving, Texas. Uh, and Blank said to Jones, are we okay? And Jones said, we're okay. But there, there's still a lot. <laughs> nobody of, thinks. There's nobody a lot thinks, of tension there. Nobody thinks that, right? Yeah, nobody thinks that. Uh, but how does it manifest itself? I know I'm, I'm returning the, the question. Don Van Nat, a senior investigative reporter on Honda Insider Report. How did, because at some point, it all leads to a collective bargaining agreement conversation. That's right. what everything, I mean, all of it, uh, player compensation, player safety, player discipline, commissioner's right to discipline, all of that is maneuvering Absolutely. towards what's happening in a few years from now. That's right. Correct? Yes. Okay, and, so. And I and I think some of these, you know, these spats will probably be repaired by then because that's the ball game, right? And, and, and you know, Rich, you raise a really good point. A big reason why Roger Goodell got re-upped is because there were some owners that I spoke with and some of their executives who said, you know what, we're not pleased with Roger Goodell's overall job performance, but we want him there in that room when the next collective bargaining agreement is up because of what a great job that was done in 2011. I mean, the owners steamrolled the players back in 2011. And the owners want that result again. And it's trust the devil I know over the devil I don't know. And in terms of, uh, you know, um, his contract, it was reported and stated that this is going to be the commissioner's last one. Right. As best you can tell, is there already maneuvering as to who's going to take his job in 2024, literally seven I, years from now, Don. Yeah, and I would be surprised if Goodell uh, is there to the very last day of, of his contract. Is that right? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see the commissioner after the collective bargaining agreement is struck. Which and is after, 2021, correct? Correct. Uh -huh. And after we have the new Hope, television contract. Hopefully, contracts, by the way. Hopefully, right. <laughs> if we don't have a strike or a lockout uh, or, yeah, or, yeah. Right, or, or interruption in the game. That's a little too much insider report. I don't even <laughs> want to go there, Don. <laughs> right. But, but I think that in 2022 or 2023, we may see Roger leave early. Uh, he's made noises about that with some people close to him. And yeah, there was maneuvering just this fall. There was Another problem that Jerry Jones had in his push for looking beyond Roger Goodell is, well, who is there? There's not a deep bench in the NFL office. There was not an obvious candidate there. The usual names came up. Condoleezza Rice has said it would be a dream job of hers to be the NFL commissioner. Her name was mentioned. A couple of other names were mentioned. What other names? What are you hearing? 
Uh, you know, I'd rather. Well, I'd it's rather, called insider report, Tom. <laughs> I know. You know, there, 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 there were a couple of other names, but I don't think they ever got any traction. You know, as Seth and I reported, uh, Adam Silver, the the NBA commissioner, somebody, one of the owners, had a, an emissary reach out to see if if uh, if he would be uh, uh, interested. Uh, interested, and and very quickly said no. And what's remarkable about that is, think about that: the the NBA commissioner doesn't want to go over to the NFL job. Because the NFL job has so many problems. I mean, the NFL is in a is in a is in a tough spot right now on many fronts. But you know that that can and, and because that's one way to look at it. Another way is that Adam Silver's got a job at the NBA. He's doing a great job at it. It's very successful yeah. there. That doesn't mean that the NBA is more successful than no. the NFL. No. Or that you want to buy stock in the NBA more than the NFL. You know, I'm. Trying to flip it here. No, a all bit, I'm Don. saying though is I think I think that Adam Silver's job where he is is, is is an easier job than if he were to move over oh, really? to the NFL. When was the last conversation you had with Cuban? <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's a or good point. Or Reinsdorf. That's I mean, I'm point. sure there's enough of a of a pit over there, uh, for the lack of a better phrase. Uh, I want to take a break. Back in 60 seconds to discuss the ratings front on the NFL, whether you really do believe the NFL is in ratings trouble. And then there's a, a, a case in front of the Supreme Court that could change the game for all sports because sports gambling could be legalized in, in uh, many forms. Uh, Don Van Natta, that was the Honda Insider Report here on the Rich Eisen Show. And I just want to make sure that you all know that the Happy Honda Day sales event is going on right now. The best time to get a great deal on a Honda is right now. But you have to hurry, because unlike the snowball in your freezer, these deals won't be around forever. See, I'm using lines around a rider <laughs> like that. With Don Van Natta, back with Don in 60 seconds. Okay, welcome back to the Rich Eisen Show. ESPN senior investigative reporter Don Van Natta returns here for another segment. Before we return uh, to the sports world, when you were with the Times, with the New York Times, uh, what were the stories that you worked on there that you would point to, say, these were the ones that I remember or I'm glad are on my resume, and what people will discuss? Which uh, the, ones are the... the impeachment of Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. I was in Washington for six years, so I covered the impeachment of Bill Clinton and the Monica Lewinsky scandal in 1998. 2001, I was there for 9-11. I actually heard the plane hit the Pentagon from my house in Alexandria, Virginia, mm. uh, and covered counterterrorism uh, out of London for the Times from 2003 to 2005, which was a, a great experience. I also covered the phone hacking scandal, the Murdoch phone hacking scandal uh, in the UK, 2010, 2011. So why'd you decide to, you know what, I'm going to leave the hard news world behind and go into the sports world. I had a great opportunity. You know, I was a frustrated would-be sports writer, Rich. Uh, I wrote two books about sports while I was at the Times, uh, and I got this opportunity. Chad Millman called me in the summer of 2011 and asked if I would be willing to join ESPN and uh, kick the tires on that, and it, it looked like a great opportunity. I've had just nothing but fun. Yeah, when, uh, I, went, when I was at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern, my, my uh, professor uh, in the quarter uh, where we went to Washington, D.C. and became correspondents for local TV stations, used us as their local correspondents because I guess we were cheap labor. <laughs> and plus, it was a great experience for us. Lou Prado is his name. He's a big Penn State yeah. University uh, football historian. Anyway, he would always say, you know, uh, Eisen, why do you want to work in the toy department? He would call the sports world the toy department. Would you agree with that? That's what it, it's called? It is the toy department, but I felt there was such a great opportunity for me as an investigative reporter to do sports investigative reporting. I felt it was a pretty open playing field. There were only a few people in the country really that got the resources and the time necessary to really dig deeply into some of the subjects that ESPN has allowed me to do. So for that reason, it really was. It's the toy department, but it's about politics. It's about culture. It's about race. You're writing about all the big issues that any news reporter is writing about. And, uh, you know, the money is huge. The stakes are huge. The egos are even bigger. Uh, it, it's just it's a it was a great opportunity. So what do you think, returning to the first topic of conversation that we had before we do move on to sports gambling and uh, the TV ratings of the NFL uh, about the kneeling uh, during the national anthem? Obviously, that became literally a political football. Yeah. Um, how do you think this is going to play out based on your reporting and what you know? for the 2018 season? Well, it's going to be interesting to see what the owners do at the winter meetings in March. Um, Jerry Jones this fall, again, was at the forefront of this issue. He pushed hard for there to be a league-wide ban on any players kneeling during the national anthem. Uh, that didn't get much traction with folks back in October at the, at the league meetings at the Conrad Hotel in Lower Manhattan. Um, I think there's going to be uh, renewed discussions about this in March, though I don't think 
there's going to be enough owners that are going to want to mandate it because it can backfire. It can backfire very easily and very quickly. Uh, you know, they're in a bind. They're in a tough spot. I think the fact that the owners have uh, basically reached out and tried to have a, a, an honest, open dialogue with players and the Players Coalition and to try to put a, a big amount of money into these causes that they want – uh, the sign there, Rich, is with a little bit of a wink and a nod of a quid pro quo. Like if we give you the NFL platform to help uh, on these criminal justice issues and really try to make a change, as well as put money to the causes that you want, hopefully that will be enough for players no longer uh, to take a knee during the national anthem. I think if you asked owners behind a closed door, they would tell you that's the result they think is best for the business uh, and for the game. Uh, but if you talk to players, they're not willing to necessarily give up a constitutional right to kneel and to protest uh, just for a paycheck. And I talk to fans, okay, and 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 there are fans who call this show who have uh, served uh, militarily or in, as a first responder who say it's the player's right to do that. And I have some who are on the other, the, uh, I don't want to say side, okay, but there are those who say that the players should stand up, okay, that this is not the time to utilize uh, employees, as a platform. Right, they're employees. And, and but all that said, there is the narrative that's out there that this issue that we are discussing right now, Don Van Natta, senior investigative reporter of ESPN, is the root cause for the lack of rating spikes, that 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 the ratings are down. And part of the, I, I saw, I don't know what his name is, some conservative talk show host put a f photograph of the Browns' home game this past weekend and said this is what liberalism does, okay? And, and no mention of the 0-13 oh, record. Well, 0-14. Oh 0-14, oh <laughs> right, exactly. But you see what I'm saying is that th this is being utilized, used, or is it an accurate portrayal based on what you are seeing about the ratings in the NFL, Don? I, I don't think it's the, the main cause. I really don't. I, I think that the controversy hasn't helped. Um, already we saw a softening in ratings last year. Uh, it was chalked up uh, by some folks in the league office to the presidential campaign and, and uh, because, of course, the ratings went up somewhat in the second half of last year. Well, I do remember there was a Sunday night game and a Monday night game, uh, and one involving Aaron Rodgers and Eli Manning, another involving Breeze and, and Ryan in a, in a league where, you know, obviously first-string top-flight yep. quarterbacks are becoming rarer and rarer. They went up against uh, two of the three debates Right. So I do remember that. Yeah. Um, are, are these ratings taking into account streaming? I mean, I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal that they are not. They're not. And that that that's definitely a problem uh, because that's how a lot of fans are now getting the games. They're getting them on their mobile phones and on their iPads. Um, I think that the anthem issue definitely didn't help. But um, the saturation, the, the saturation of, uh, you know, oversaturation of the of the product is a big problem. The Thursday night football. Uh, games have been awful this year. Um, there's so many injuries. There's so many marquee players that are out. So you you put all of these into the mix, and they're they're all issues, and they're and they all are you know depressing the ratings. Well, I do have to Don Van Natta point out there was a 41-39 Rams 49ers game on Thursday Night Football that Carson Wentz beat Cam Newton on Thursday Night Football. There were there weren't all awful. You're right. <laughs> gotta point there was that out. one or two that were, but that were okay. I do, I do say, and I say from this microphone in this seat that the oversaturation is a problem. I do this for a living. If I did not do this for a living, and I have a wife and three children at home, as I do, and I have, as you see, this Michigan Wolverine helmet yes. on the desk, so that's <laughs> one window of football that I am definitely going to utilize as a dad and a husband. Uh, I'm going to definitely watch Michigan. And then if there's three other college football windows and five, six, depending on whether there's an early London game, windows right. of NFL football from Thursday to Monday, uh, how much football can somebody watch right. and live their lives? Yeah, and how special is it? You're right. I mean, on those London days at 930 in the morning, Eastern time, uh, until midnight, you've got pro football on. Uh, the Red Zone channel is another factor, of course. A lot of fans are just watching that. There's mm -hmm. no commercials on that. You know, it's dipped in a little bit. Sure. But, but, there's, but there's no ads for that. Um, it, I think the oversaturation is really uh, uh, the biggest issue. I think talking to owners and executives, that's what they're seeing it as. Um, and it's something they're going to have to deal with. Uh, the, you know, Thursday night football, um, you're right. Not all the games have been awful. That was unfair to say that. But most of them have been. And they've been – some of them have just been unwatchable. Uh, some of the Monday night games have not been terrific either. 
And uh, there's too many games. It doesn't feel special. It doesn't feel like appointment viewing anymore. Even on Thanksgiving, you know, there's that now. There's the Thanksgiving night game. Remember how great it was when we were growing up? It was just at Dallas and at and at Detroit, those mm -hmm. two games. And now you've got a third game. Um, it just feels like it's too much. Last one for you, Don Van Natta, ESPN senior investigative reporter. The, uh, the, the suit in front of the case in front of the Supreme Court about sports gambling, what should fans know about this and how do you think it will play out and change the way that we view sports if it comes to pass here? Legal experts who know a lot more about this than I do say that they feel there is a better than 50% chance, maybe a 60 or 70% chance that the Supreme Court is going to rule in favor of Governor Christie and New Jersey, and there will be, le will be legal sports wagering in New Jersey. If that happens, uh, I think we will see a quick domino effect of other states. There's already states that have made preparations for this, like Pennsylvania, Mississippi, several states. Very quickly, within several years, you'll see 15 to 20 state legislatures around the country legalizing sports wagering. That's going to turbocharge the ratings. It's going to turbocharge uh, fan interest again in the NFL in a way that we can't even imagine. Uh, and I think that's what we're going to see. But the league is pushing back against our... our, our... That, that, that's, what's, that's what's so interesting, Rich. Because of the long tradition uh, in the NFL, uh, that anti-gambling anti tradition in the NFL, and Goodell is still there, they're pushing back. They're pushing back, uh, you know, against this in the Supreme Court. But it will help them. Um, they see how fantasy has helped them. I mean, just imagine what legal sports wagering will do in half the country, two-thirds of the country, what it would do for interest in the NFL. Fans will be sticking to the last second of every game to see whether the over-under hits. Uh, I mean, it'll, it'll be a different ballgame. Don, thanks for coming in. Again, I really enjoy your work. I follow you on Twitter. Glad that now we have uh, met face-to-face. -face. Come back anytime. Let me know when you're in Los Angeles. Okay? I will do that. Thank you, Rich. You got it. Appreciate Check it. out Don Van Natta's work and follow him on Twitter, at DVN Junior, J-R, on Twitter. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern, on Audience.